My name's Kathleen Crony and I was delighted to take on the role as tour guide during the Up the Middle Road project and I found it a profoundly moving experience learning about the people's lives, people who had been so closely connected to the Crichton, people who had been treated here, others who had actually worked here and other folk who had lived here, they had grown up on the estate so intrinsically linked to it and to hear their words, their very personal stories, it was like a, a tangible connection to the past. Here we are at the Crichton Estate, the heart of an absolutely beautiful environment, a place that has got a very powerful feeling of sanctuary, somewhere where you can come and retreat to amazing gardens, beautiful trees and flowers, and of course very much characterised by these rich, warm sandstone buildings, none more beautiful than the Crichton Memorial Church. And all of these places still echo with the essence of the people of the past, those who spent time here, those whose stories are so closely woven into the very fabric of these buildings that still speak to us today and celebrate the spirit of human courage and resilience. Okay, hi, hello, hello everybody. Um, can, you, can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me at the side? Can you hear me at the front? Um, I'm Valentina Bold and a Heritage Officer with the Crichton Trust. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to Up the Middle Road, Crichton Stories of Resilience and Recovery. For the past two years, I've been recording people who remember the Crichton as it was, as long and short-term patients, as nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, administrators, housekeepers, caterers, masters of works. And I've learned about families who lived here at the village for several generations. The Cannons, the Houlistons, the Stranges, the Marchbanks, the Blacks, to name a few. The stories that you're about to hear are based on what they said. A few, with permission, are quoted directly. Many of the people that I've talked with are here. Some I recognise as we talked here or spoke by Zoom. Others I know only by voice because we talked over the pandemic by phone. And if you are one of these people, please come and say hello at the end. I'll recognise your voice even if I, don't, <laughs> if I don't know your faces yet. So that would be lovely. And thank you, all of you, for generously sharing your time and your knowledge to make what you're about to hear possible. Now the title of this work is taken from the local name for the Crichton. John McQueen, who was first a patient and later an undertaker here, described it to me in these words. Most people knew about the Crichton. You could go up the top way, Easterbrook Hall, or down the bottom end where the main gate is to the Solway, and one up to the Crichton. It was, oh, you're going the middle road. Well, you'd go up there, but you'd be half daft quite mad. That was the prevailing thought. I think there's still some people like that about it. When I went up the middle road, it was terrible. Not for me, but you know, everybody will talk about me, how bad it was. For some people, the Crichton was bad, but for many, 
it was a place of sanctuary and asylum, and our stories communicate both these experiences. There's at least one story that you might find difficult to listen to, and we'll warn you about that beforehand. Please feel free to withdraw at any time, and if you wish, to return later. Our mental health first aider, Emma Scott, who is over here, is here to support you if you need her. Please feel free to make yourself known to her or um, to approach one of our apprentices, Dan, who is on sound, and Zeph, who is looking out at the side there. And they're both there to help you, as are our volunteers who you can see wearing um, the T-shirts with the Crichton uh, motto on it, God Said Grace. The performance is in two halves, each with a pause point and one longer stop. And at the long stops, you'll be treated to new songs from Emily Smith and Jamie McLennan and new stories from Amanda Edmiston. And theirs are creative responses. They capture the essence of people's experiences in new forms, staying respectful to the original, diverse stories. We hope you'll enjoy them. In between, it was our intention that you would tour with Kathleen Crony of Mostly Ghostly, but unfortunately, Kathleen's ill. So I'll do my best, with Amanda's help, to fulfil her role. And please bear with us and forgive the fact that we're using notes, which Kathleen wouldn't do, but we needed to do a very quick script rewrite and we haven't learned it, so just bear with us on that. In terms of housekeeping, there are toilets at Easterbrook Hall, at Crichton Church and here at Crichton Central, and there will be a chance to use these at the interval. Should you require access during the performance, just let us know. Most of the performance is going to be out of doors. The walking sections of the tour last between five and 10 minutes. And if you have mobility issues or start to tire, let us know. We have a taxi on hand, which should be here any minute. Um, Zeph's just waiting for it. <laughs> and that taxi can carry you between the, the points where we're pausing, no, no problem. So just let us know if you would like a, a, a lift. We'd be grateful because of the COVID situation at the moment, if you could keep social distance between your own party and, and others. Most of, us, most of this is outdoors, so it's, it's pretty safe. But at the end, we're going to be going inside Crichton Church. And we would ask you, unless you were previously exempt, which is fine, to, to wear a mask if you can. We've got boxes of them in there, just for that section of the performance where we'll be indoors. And there's a small exhibition in the church as well. There'll be a short interval where you can pick up your free um, ticket price included can of juice, which will be served by the former catering manager at the Crichton, David Matheson, over here, who will be ably assisted by Ian Boddy, who trained as a mental health nurse here in the, in the 1970s and ended as general manager of mental health, and Yvonne Sterling, who is over there. And Yvonne started here as a cadet nurse in the 1960s and finished as Assistant Director of Nursing Services. And they all contributed memories, and I'm very grateful to them, as well as for their drinks um, <laughs> abilities too. Um, finally, I'd like to thank our funders, Scotland's Year of Stories 2022's Community Fund, supported by Museum Galleries Scotland, the Heritage Lottery Foundation, and Events Scotland, Creative Scotland, the Crichton Foundation, and the Archie Sutter Watt Trust. We will be um, filming parts of the um, event today and a link for that will be available so please put your phone in silent and let us film for you because that will be online later but what I really wanted to say at this point is that stories are I firmly believe the best way to understand the significant place and what happened here we're hoping that listening while we tour will go some way to dispelling the stigmas that are still held around mental ill health these are truly stories of resilience and recovery. We hope you'll enjoy them. I'll pass over to Amanda now. Thank you, Valentina. So, as, uh, as Val said, do excuse the script. <laughs> um, we're gathered here at Crichton Central, on the edge of the Crichton Royal Estate, to journey through stories of real people. The Crichton was a community with its own farm, shop, swimming pool and playing fields. There were over a thousand staff and a huge number of patients. Everyone knew everyone else. 
Crichton Central was formerly known as Cripple View. People with learning disabilities were treated here. And across the car park, over, over this side, stands the sandstone building of Eskdale, which uh, once housed the adolescent unit. Eskdale focused on the outdoors and creative approaches to education, including art therapy. A former patient, Peter, remembered making really firm friendships there and picking strawberries for pocket money. He took comfort from a silver coin given to him by another child. Sadly, he lost the coin and uh, maybe, well, who knows? Maybe that bit of treasure is still here. To the right of Eskdale, if you can see beyond the buildings, our Ladyfield East and West, where children under 12 were supported. And then across the road, Hannafield provided care for the very youngest patients, even babies. Beyond Estill is Brown Hill School, Brown Hall School, do excuse me, where the staff of the children's staff walked there over a cinder path. They played in the estate, and in the winter they sledged at Maiden Bower. They knew many of the long-term patients, Bruce Lindsay, who later trained as a nurse, particularly rem remembered Skinner, who uh, fed the estate children jammy pieces on demand. She once even saved his life when he got trapped in a fire escape. The building beyond Crichton Central is the former laundry. The second one, the original was by Johnston House, which is now the Holiday Inn. And within the next few years, the old laundry will become the new Crichton Centre for memory and well-being, a new space for education, research, performances and reflection. Behind us, this wonderful building with the clock tower, is the Solway Industrial Unit, where uh, patients were worked for therapy, but they were paid nominal wages and uh, took part in picture framing, toy making and printing. Crichton staff had their wedding invitations printed there too. One former nurse, Rab Wilson, recalled it was cheaper than the printer in town and just as lovely, with embossed paper and gilt writing, made by people, he said, who took real satisfaction in producing their work. Beyond Sol Solway sat the farm, where the estate produced its own food, and it is still there, but now it's part of Scotland's rural college. There are many stories we could tell, but before we leave Solway, I'd just like to mention a couple in particular. In the 1940s, Brian Strange, whose father was the master of works, had a job as a child. His job was to wind the clock there in the tower every morning. Senior staff, like his father, had a patient to help them round the house. Brian himself went on to serve his apprenticeship here. At Solway House, the beginning of the working day, if you can imagine, was heralded by a loud hooter. We're standing here now at Heston, which was at one time a long-stay hostel ward. Later, it became the alcohol unit, which moved here from Glen Cairn. The alcohol unit, under Dr Cameron, moved away from a traditional all-or-nothing approach, as a former worker told me, to look at the reasons behind drinking with a view to changing behaviour. It later moved to Cameron House in town, and Crichton had a long tradition of offering outreach services at clinics across Dumfries and Galloway. Galloway, which you would see behind me were it not for the very large um, hedge, but it's over there at the back, um, was a unit for elderly people at one time, and it's got a lot of good stories around it. Um, Many of the buildings at the Crichton are supposed to be haunted, Galloway is one of them, but one of the good stories is about Maxwell House, which we're not going to see tonight, but if you're back on the estate, look out for it. And Maxwell was supposed to be a house that had strange noises at night, um, and a lot of the night staff heard this. And it was believed to be the ghost of a former patient who walked three times around the space where there had been a snooker table up the stairs and then back down again. So that was heard by some of the night staff in that building. In terms of Galloway, um, Bruce Lindsay, who was here last night, um, which was lovely, told me about an elder, elderly patient with a memorable name. It was spelt D-E-G-A-T-H. And she dressed in black and had white hair. And in a deep voice, 
she would introduce herself as Lady Death. She had this belief, he told me, that she was Lady Death. People came from, to the Crichton from far and wide to work, and for treatments too, from North and South America, across Europe, and over the border too. Um, Sir, Ma Sir Martin Roth, for instance, was an eminent psychiatrist at the Maudsley, and then came up to work at the Crichton, and later returned again to work in England. And he was invited to work here by Dr. Willie Meyer Gross. Uh, Meyer Gross had a reputation for bringing Jew Jewish members of staff here, particularly just prior to the Second World War. And together with Elliot Slater, who didn't actually work here, but Meyer, Gross and Roth wrote what became the standard textbook of sight. As well as the elderly, the Crichton accommodated young people, pregnant teenager mothers, for instance, including a 16-year-old who came here from Canada on one occasion. And Yvonne Sterling remembered mothers coming in with postpartum psychosis, sometimes more than once. I know people say these days, she said, people didn't know about it then. Well, that's not true, we did. But some of the treatments here would probably not be carried out now. And I'd like to quote um, from Sandra, who was a, a trans woman treated here as an 11 year old in the 1970s. Her story is hard to hear, but it's very important to tell. If you would prefer not to listen, I suggest that you go onwards at this point with Seth, who will take you on to our next stop and we'll catch up with you there. So I'll just give you a moment in case you feel that you would like not to hear this story. And Sandra told me, I started dressing at seven year old. I used to hide in my mother's clothes. What had happened was my father caught me. That was at the age of 11. He said he could take me to the Crichton and they'd give me electric shock treatment. That was the thing in them days, to get it out of you. But it never worked. Because I think you know that I was born with it. I should have been born a girl because my mother was wanting a girl. I think that's, how, that's why. And it's a very brave um, thing, I think, for Sandra to allow us to, sh to share her story tonight. So I want to thank her sincerely for doing that. Staff sometimes struggled with assisting treatments here. Um, Josie Vickers, for instance, in her teens herself, took a young person for ACT treatment just the once. She refused to do it again. And Betty Tyndall remembered in her early days at the Crichton, which was in the 50s, there were prefrontal leucotomies that destroyed people's personality. It's something she still prefers not to remember. But you can read more about Sandra and Betty's experiences later in the small exhibition at the church. So what we're going to do now is to move off and walk briskly again to our next stop, which is Grierson House, where Amanda, Emily and Jane will meet us. So I'd like to welcome you all to Grierson House. People who were in need of the, the most intensive care were supported here. And on this veranda, patients who were most ill and unable to work or walk would sit during the day with a nurse by their side. There were lighter moments too. Muir Hunter, a former nurse, remembered how on the night shift at Grierson, Staff would phone down orders to the chip shop in St Michael's Street. <laughs> Muir was told to take his bike down to collect the, the suckers, uh, but he had to wait for the bus back. Now, he couldn't understand why he had to wait for the bus before coming back, he had his bike with him. But then, after speaking to his pal in the chippy, Muir discovered the secret. You had to travel in the slipstream of the bus so the wind didn't get in your face. <coughs> Trick worked every time, apparently. So I'm going to pass over now to Jamie and Emily, play you the first of our, our musical pieces today. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, before we begin, I would say thanks again to all of the, the staff and patients for sharing their stories and giving us such amazing inspiration to work with for the songs that we've written. The first song that we're going to sing you is pretty much named after the project, Up the Middle Road, and it was the first song that Jamie and I wrote when we began this process. After talking about, um, well, lots of aspects of, of all that we'd read, but 
mainly about trying to break down that stigma with mental health, how many people maybe suffer for just part of their life or maybe all of their life with mental health. And we, we wanted to focus on the positive experiences that people he had here at the Crichton, whether th that came with the, the sense of just coming here for some sanctuary from their daily lives or in the, spending time in the beautiful outdoors. I know that helped a lot of people. The sense of accomplishment um, through the work that they carried out all the time. So it's all a bit of a melting pot that went into this song. So up in the middle. Yeah. Traveller's Tale, about a boy who could be anybody. It could be my brother. He could be yours. A boy who was happy some of the time, busy a lot of the time, but some called him idle. 
and didn't see the value in the things that he chose to do. Jack liked to be outside. He was never, ever happy indoors. He liked to look up at the sky and watch the clouds roll across weaving stories. He liked to be down by the river or in the woods. He was never, ever happy indoors. But one thing Jack loved more than anything were stories. Every day he would beg his mum to tell him a story. And there was one story Jack loved more than any other. It was the tale of a boy who sought the dark cloak. A pair of shoes, the shoes of swiftness, and an enchantment held within a silver coin. And when he found these objects, he had to choose between them. Now, Jack loved this bit of the story, and he knew the beginning so well, but he'd never heard the end. He and his mother were poor. She had to work really hard to make ends meet. And as soon as she sat down to tell Jack the story, well, something would call her away. The dishes would need washing, or her work needed her, or the baby started crying. And Jack never got to the end of the tale. He never found out that the cloak of darkness, the shoes of swiftness, and the coin of enchantment were really magical ways to describe health, wealth, and happiness. His mother never got to the end of the story and she never spotted how much time Jack started to spend looking for these magical objects. She didn't notice that he didn't always make it into school. She sometimes didn't spot that he didn't come home at night. So intent was he on this sack seeking these objects that he was sure were going to bestow some kind of magic into his life. Jack spent day after day searching. He began to find the four grey walls and four grey towers of his school more and more oppressive. The endless instruction, the demands made on him, it took to spending every day down by the river, down dark alleys, in woods and parks, outside, endlessly searching for the cloak, the shoes and the silver coin. He recalled words of a rhyme, maybe bits of a verse, maybe they were a riddle, maybe they held a clue. Over the river lie fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and touch the sky. The words had an essence and Jack felt sure that maybe a cloak of darkness could clothe a wold and reach the sky. A cloak of darkness would give him somewhere safe to hide, somewhere warm. He'd be able to escape all these voices that went on and on at him, telling him what to do. Willows whiten, aspen shiver. A shower of sunbeams break and quiver by the stream that runneth ever with the islands in the river. It felt that was how it went. Maybe shoes of swiftness would run as fast as a stream, run like the river. Maybe, maybe he'd find the shoes of swiftness in the river bank, maybe trapped in a, in a muddy bit by the edge of the water's flow. Shoes of swiftness would make him able to run and to flee. Shoes of swiftness could help him run errands. Maybe he could earn money. Maybe he would start to feel safe. Jack sought these objects. He traveled as far as he could. 
and eventually there was only one place left that he hadn't been. He came to a junction. First, he ventured up the glen road. He looked around the glen, but there was no cloak, no shoes, nothing magical there. And then he traversed down the bank path, down towards the net, where the quicksand threatened to grab and suck his feet under. He walked down to the Solway and watched the tide ebb out and flow back in, those dancing horses crashing on the shore. But he couldn't find anything magical there. And now tired and exhausted, he went back to the junction and he looked up the middle road the only path he'd not searched up before. He started to make his way up this path and he was really tired. Fatigue filled his body. And then he spotted creamy blossom of a may in flower, a hawthorn tree. The tree said to mark the entrance to fairy world on top of a wee grassy mound. And now he sat down beneath that tree and rested his back against the bark and smelled the strange aroma of the blossom, it started to doze. But he was awoken by a tall, imposing figure of a woman dressed in crisp, white, starched clothes. She looked down at him and said, Jack, I know what you seek and I can help you. But you'll need to come with me. I have three tasks for you to complete first. Well, Jack was a, a little scared, but he had nothing left to lose. So he decided to go with her, and he ventured up the middle road. She set him his first task, to go down to the field and collect strawberries. She gave him a basket, told him his task would only be completed when it was full. Day after day, Jack went down, crouching low in the straw that was sheltering the strawberries. Looking at these plants, they all looked the same. He didn't understand why he was there, searching for the ripe red fruit. The noise of the other children made him feel stressed and upset. However hard he tried, he could not fill that basket with fruit. Day after day, he kept looking and trying to fill the basket. And then slowly something shifted. He started to find the, other, the company of the other children. More comforting. He easily found the juiciest, ripest, reddest strawberries. And he loved their fragrance and their smell. Biting into them, he felt the sweet juice on his tongue. He took to looking forward to those sunny mornings. And the next day he went down looking forward to picking strawberries and he found that his basket filled within just an hour. And the tall woman dressed in white returned and smiling beckoned him on to his second task. Now he must go down to the quay where they tramped the flounder. But Jack, Jack was given a line and a hook and told to catch a salmon. Well, Jack didn't know about catching fish. He, he didn't know why. He was frightened of the deep water and he, and he watched and he waited and nothing happened and the days went by and he still hadn't caught this fish. But slowly but surely he started to enjoy the sound of the running water. He thought about how it gave him water to drink, water to swim in, water to bathe in, water to help grow those strawberries he'd grown to love. And he saw how when certain flies landed near the water, the fish would leap and jump. And he saw how a hazelnut fell from a tree, and as it splashed, the huge 
silver head of a salmon leapt up and caught the nut in his mouth. Now Jack knew. He climbed up the tree, cracked open one of the hazelnuts and put it on his hook. Now he flicked the hook into the water with a splash. And as soon as he had, a salmon leapt up and caught it. And before you knew it, Jack had an enormous silvery fish lying in his lap. As if by magic, the woman reappeared and beckoned him on to his third and final task. She took him to a place where he was given a tent, a sleeping bag, a jam jar with crystal clear magical water from a well, small basket of strawberries and a bag of hazelnuts. He followed the children high, high up <coughs> the mountain, the highest place of all, where the cloud sunk low on the ground. Looking out, he could feel the whole world stretch out below him. Deep reservoir waters rippled in the sunshine behind, and they pitched their tents. Jack had never been so frightened in his life. The place filled him with fear and dread. Every step, he could hear the crunch of the spiral snails that crawled on the grass and he cried thinking of their loss. Above circled kites threatening to treat him as prey but the dread was worse. They pitched their tents, they sang but Jack was still afraid. In the morning his fear was realised. He undid the tent to see the most terrifying thing he'd ever seen in his life. The fairy dark face with two coiling horns on either side of its eyes. The white shaggy back. He screamed and ran. He had to hide. He'd never seen anything so terrifying. Sheep, the children laughed. Sheep, Jack, you're scared of a sheep. And Jack felt ashamed. From his hiding spot, he watched the sheep. He watched how they were followed by tiny lambs, their bleating calling to their mothers. He watched as the sheep made their way between the heather and picked out the eyebright in the St John's wort. Slowly but surely, Jack stopped being afraid. He explored those hills and eventually made his way back down with the other children, happy and singing along. When he arrived back, he was greeted by the woman once more. She said, have you got what you came here for, Jack? And he looked at her. He now knew the answer. The cloak of darkness is happiness. The silver shoes of swiftness are health. But I still don't know about the silver coin, this enchantment that I was promised. She reached into her pocket and gave Jack a silver coin. She said, the things you sought were always there, Jack. They were always inside of you. You just needed to know where to look. But here's the silver coin. You keep that. It'll help you find your way back, because if you ever need us, we'll be here. Our second song also features that silver coin, inspired all of us, I think, and it's um, a song called Refuge, which was mainly based upon one of the teenage patients' memories and, um, I won't say adventures, but uh, <laughs> activities that went on in his time here, so this is what we <laughs> Bathroom door. 
Morris sold it cheap in an antique store. Showed me places I've not been before. Try to see the world through another eyes. Seasons came and the summer came. Try to board a southbound train, but they turned me back, and so I walked anyway. Crossed the border in a single day. Track me down.
from the estate children born here to the marriages and funerals that took place in this church. The Crichton had its own chapel and many staff got married here. It was just something you did. So too did at least two long-term patient couples. Many nurses remember a, a long-stay patient, Trixie. She loved weddings. She often turned up in wedding photos. But more of her later on. When a, a patient died, the staff would carry out the last offices, washing and dressing the deceased. If there were no relatives, the Crichton paid for the funeral. John McQueen, the undertaker, who Val mentioned earlier, his wife lined the coffins with the finest silks. In talking about all of this, we want to remember the kind of strong sense of community, a community which aimed to provide support during difficult times to people within the crime. And we know the memories are mixed. Not all are positive, and, and we've done our very best to try and respect the stories of everyone who's experienced this place. And we hope that, that we can now move beyond stigma through stories into a place of understanding and perhaps develop a new appreciation for this site. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my process as I started to develop stories. As I was collecting, reading the collected oral histories and um, researching historic treatments for mental health as I prepared for Up the Middle Road, one thing for me started to emerge from the rest. The number of personal recollections and narratives that shared common threads with fairy tales. Now, now this may come as a surprise for many folk, but when you consider that stories always provided a safe place to look at and reflect on difficult topics that we might find uncomfortable. Safe places to, to look at things we find hard to define or understand. A place to consider other people's struggles and transitions. It may make more sense. If you add to that that the treatments often have herbal counterparts, the effects which are often the symbolic trigger for a related but more dramatic response in fairy stories, you may be less surprised that the topics and stories shared by the staff and patients of the Crichton started to find immediate parallels with the stories I've looked at and collected over my 12 years as a Herbert storyteller. Apples and figs, they appear quite often in Northern European and Jewish folk tales. And they have constituents that we now extract and use to treat diabetes in the same way that insulin is used. In the fairy tales, those apples and figs often lull people into a, a healing, soothing sleep where revelations happen. Insulin was used in a controversial, but at the time, groundbreaking treatment by Dr. Maya Gross for relieving the symptoms of schizophrenia. My story starts, however, with a young woman. She was drawn here. She travelled to learn to nurse here. A rarer thing in those days, but she was drawn to the high standard and reputation of the Crichton and then stayed because of the community feel and the groundbreaking work of the doctors. She could see the magic of the place, the beauty of the buildings, the safety of the landscape, the best practice observed here, surpassing the efforts of many others, and the positive impact on the people's lives who found their way up the middle road. No pathway leading to this place was the same 
and she listened to the way poetry fell from the lips of Dr. Miller Mayer. She heard the thread of stories, starting to bond old fabrics in new ways and become new narratives, forming safety structures, parachute work to hold people as they fell. Caring for a young woman not far of her own age, a girl they'd said had had episodes before, but this time she'd been out laughing and drinking, misbehaving and had found herself expecting a baby without a husband's hand to hold, or so the story went. The girl told stories of how her mother was not her real mother, not her birth mother, a stepmother, she insisted, although the records showed otherwise. She hated her, the girl said. She'd grown jealous and wanted rid of her, although the mother regularly sent presents and letters inquiring after her daughter, gifts and asking when she would be fit to come home. The girl could not sleep as the baby cried. She could not sleep as the baby slept, and she grew wild, and her episodes got worse. She said her mother had tried to kill her with a poison comb, sent her on errands into the snow to find strawberries out of season that she hoped she would never return from. The nurse tried to tell her stories and read her poems, asked her to draw, to paint, to garden, to grow. She'd become distraught, and now they gave her a blood sugar balancing apple. As she bit into it, she claimed her mother had sent it and was trying to poison her. But then she slipped into a deep sleep, and they hoped she would work out her troubles as she dreamt. Meanwhile, mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the luckiest of them all? Our young nurse looked into a mirror and reflected on how fortunate she was. She'd met and fallen in love with a handsome young gardener that worked on the grounds. And now as they walked and talked, holding hands as they strolled down the lime tree avenue, the tilial scented blossoms falling confetti-like as they walked. Playing loves me, loves me not with the bruise healing daisies that littered the lawn. As a world war raged on, the pair decided to be wed. But this was the era of make, do and mend. And uh, fabric was hard to come by. But she was gifted a parachute and now she took it and she washed and she drew and she cut and she pinned, taking a needle she sewed, thread by thread and then stepping out to a church and the lawn. Every friend, every relative, they were sure was invited, holding invitations made on site, gold embossed invitations. Surely no one had been left out, but there at the back a mysterious guest stood, a woman dressed glamorously, watching, smiling, fatty, fairy-like, appearing as if by magic to grace the celebration. Away in the bungalow, another young woman awoke. They took a few days off just to be in love, turning over the wedding dress and finding a rent in the silk. Our young nurse once again washed the dress, took her tailor's chalk and her scissors. She drew, she cut, pinned and sewed and turned the dress into a fine dressing gown, one that fluttered and caressed her form as she walked down the stairs. Returning to work, 
washing those who trace the lines of recovery, drawing lines on charts, monitoring their hopes, pinning a watch to a tunic, her husband in the garden, cutting the string to hold up the beans and watch them grow, sowing the seeds that would start fresh in the spring. Life went on. Wash it, draw it, cut it, pin it, sow. Nine months later, so beautiful did she look in that flowing dressing gown that her baby was born, its chubby pink arms waving as it cooed in its crib. And now she pushed that pram along the avenue of lime trees, catching the eye of a young woman she had once helped to care for, pushing her pram, watching as a curiously familiar figure greeted that patient and put something into the baby's pram, a glimpse of silver sparkling in the sunshine. As the mother and child departed, the woman walked on and the familiar figure now came towards her. The mysterious wedding guest says, I have something for you, a handsel for the baby, a silver coin, for in the future, you never know, you may need to give it to a boy who needs it more than you. last night. It's so new. <laughs> Still in the process of being named. But, um, so this is, yeah, from the, from the eyes of a, a child who would have grown up here. <clears throat>
6 p.m. dinners that were over too soon. But watching riders on the rage and journey to the moon. Debate by seven while we sat and stayed up late. Looking to tomorrow, we can hardly. to the people of the estate and also in the town and wider area and of course with his wife um, who have worked alongside him to look after those who have passed away. So this is our, our last song, it's called Carry Me. <coughs> Dusty shadow. 